All right, very good. All right, so um, I'm gonna, if you could just bear with me for a few minutes, Dr. Barron, um, sure. I'm just gonna go through um, a couple of basics for vascular surgery because this will be hour one of my three hour series. Um, and so um, I myself am a vascular surgeon out of Western Massachusetts and um, I've been doing Osler for about eight or nine years now. So, you know, I've kind of tried to put together, a, you know, three hours of high yield questions that I think are important for the oral boards that probably hit some of the more bigger highlights. So, you know, um, just to go through, um, I do I do have a disclosure for Medtronic Endovenous. Um, and, you know, um, this is a whole new world, right? So we're, we're hitting this virtual exam, first time ever given. Uh, we are, um, you know, getting, you know, the initial feedback of it. It's a little bit different. Um, uh, again, but the, I think there's going to be a lot of similarities to what we've had in the past. So it's going to be a similar format of they're going to ask a question, expect you to respond. Um, and the fact that you may be distant, it's still the way you respond and how you react to what the scenarios are is what they're grading you on. So just a couple of different things. I know you're going to get a little bit of this um, in the intro lecture, but you know, just make sure you check your equipment prior to everything going on. Um, sometimes uh, people like the headphones, um, the mic, um, also you're charged up. Um, make sure you're in a secluded room, good lighting, you know, appropriate background. Um, you want to make sure you're dressed professionally. Um, you know, it's still, even though you're far away, you still want to have that professional appearance. Um, adjust your screen so they can see you clearly so that they think you're paying attention to them. Uh, no fancy backgrounds, um, no food or drink. Um, here's, here's one of the things that I, I just want to throw out there. Um, don't record it. Don't even give the appearance of cheating. You know, you just want to be focused on that. You don't want them to be thinking anything different, right? And just be professional and courteous. Although you can't shake their hand at the end, but you should thank them for, for you know, the opportunity to take the exam and so forth. So. Um, those are just a couple of things I've noticed as we've started to do these virtual exams. Um, a little bit about the vascular itself, right? So if you think about it, it's one of the most feared topics, right? Um, you know, just because general surgeons are not used to it. Um, but it should be the least feared because, because if you think about it, the people really giving the exams now are not vascular surgeons. They're the general surgeons, right? So they know a little bit and they know what's appropriate, but they don't know the fine details like you do right now because you've just been through residency and you've done that anastomosis and you know what it looks like and you've been through those M&Ms and you've heard what, what endographs are. And so I think you guys are a lot more well prepared than um, the people giving the exam. In general, um, you'll see one question somewhere in that out of the 12. Um, you know, it used to be in room two, the trauma critical care, but that's no longer existent. So somewhere you'll see maybe a vascular question and it may have a critical care component. Sometimes it's a straightforward question, like usually towards the end, but you'll see something vascular related throughout the exam. A um, Couple of things about the room. Um, don't let them control you. You've got the two types of examiners, the active and the passive. So the active examiner is the one that's going to be doing a lot of question asking and respond to them appropriately. The passive examiner kind of just gives you the stem and lets you go. So you have to do a lot more talk, talking. Um, just be on guard for the intro. You know, as soon as you get into that room and you start, you know, just be careful with everything you say and do. Um, defend your answers. Um, hide your specialty. This is one that I, I, I kind of think is important. So if, like for myself, I'm a, I was a vascular fellow when I took it, and I was in a trauma critical care room with a very difficult crush injury that was going a vascular turn. 
it wasn't until halfway through the question where I started to really feel confused and they felt confused that I let them know that I'm a vascular surgeon and now you're getting to the vascular portion. And it was clear that I passed the question in the end because at the end they let me know, oh, all right, I think we got the idea. Why don't we move on? Um, so don't show your cards right away. Hold on to your specialty until midway towards the end of the question. Hey, I know what I'm talking about. Um, endovascular, this is a big change over the last couple of years. Um, I always say do not use, but I use that with caution because they are starting to accept the answers of endovascular. So a ruptured aneurysm with an EVAR, they are accepting it if you know how to do it, if that's your thing, otherwise do it open. Um, angiograms are something you need to know. Just some basic concepts. Um, they don't expect you to stent the big toe, but they do want you to know some basic concepts about endovascular. Um, let's see. So you've got four questions in 30 minutes, um, and I assume that's going to be a similar format, and they may be moving you from room to room. Um, and so just remember, keep that mental clock in your head that you want to give that you know, those 30, uh, 30 minutes, you want to get through all four questions. It's their job to get you through the four questions, but it's your job to help them get through because that last question that you kind of didn't have time for is worth the same points as that difficult first question that you wasted a lot of time on. So make sure you, you time things out right. Um, let's see. Um, here's here's something that I, I think is important. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, Dr. York, and you, you'll be hearing some of his lectures, um, he mentioned to me these six rules, and I think they're pretty good. Uh, you know, we tried to, we were sitting down and we were trying to simplify vascular as easy as possible. And if you get a vascular question and you're not sure, this is what, you know, you want to try to hit these six points and then that'll get you through. So, Number one, make the diagnosis. Number two, localize. So that means either using an ultrasound, CT angiogram, or an angiogram of some sort. You heparinize, um, unless you're contraindicated. Um, you fix the problem. Do a completion angiogram if appropriate. And then consider fasciotomy. So, you know, always think about doing those fasciotomies on those lower extremities if it's, uh, you know, if you're indicated on physical exam or your timeline, okay? So I think that, that tries to simplify those. If you keep those six steps in your head when you're getting one of these crush injuries, trauma, something like that, it might help you um, muddle your way through those questions. All right, one of the last slides. Um, these are, I tried to list the most important operations that you must know details about. The let, rest you can kind of get your way through, but you've got to have fine details about these. Um, carotid, open AAA, ruptured AAA, fempop bypass, insertion of some sort of catheter, a permacath or whatever, and a thrombectomy, okay? All right, so thanks for indulging me, and um, here's some questions. Um, we'll go through them, and uh, after that, after you, we go through our little uh, series, I'll, I'll go back and I'll, we'll try to hit some highlights and, you know, some uh, techniques to kind of answer them a little bit better. So the first one we have is a 63 year old male presents to your office from his primary care doctor. He's got an incidental finding on ultrasound. He's got a right-sided stenosis of less than 50% and a left-sided stenosis of 60%. He presents to you for evaluation. What would you like to do? Yeah, I'd like to, to talk with this patient a little bit more about um, if he's had any symptoms specifically regarding this, uh, like amaurosis fugax, um, it would be one of the things that would uh, come up initially. And then I would ask him a couple more questions about his background and some of his habits, particularly smoking, uh, if he's taking any, uh, what his cardiac status is, if he's taking beta blocker or statin, um, and see if there's some factors that could be uh, modified for him. Okay, so um, he says he's a fairly healthy 63-year-old guy. Um, he does have a history of smoking. Um, he's been smoking about a pack a day. Um, but other than that, he's been doing relatively well. He's able to climb a flight of stairs with no issues. Um, and he has been seeing his primary care doctor. He does have him on a cholesterol pill and a blood pressure medication, which he's not exactly sure what it is. 
Okay. Um, so I, I would counsel him that at this point, uh, he, and he's, he's not had any symptoms, correct? Correct. He's asymptomatic. Yeah. So without any symptoms, I think that uh, I would uh, recommend that he does modification and really strongly encourage him and su give him support to help him quit smoking. Uh, that's going to be the biggest factor. In, um, and I would explain to him that the reason he's sent to a surgeon to begin with is because uh, the stenosis, uh, when it gets severe enough, can be a risk for, uh, for stroke. And so, um, you know, some of our surgical options involve risk reduction for stroke, but he, he's not quite a candidate for that at this point. Okay. Uh, anything else you'd like to do? Um, and so uh, I would... I would make, I would like to set him up for uh, for repeat uh, evaluation um, in six months to a year uh, with ultrasound a duplex ultrasound to to kind of follow him longitudinally. Okay, all right, great. So he agrees. He leaves. Um, and let's say a couple months later, he actually now presents to your emergency room with a TIA that resolved. He had right arm and leg weakness, and on repeat ultrasound was found to have right-sided stenosis of less than 50%, left-sided stenosis of 60%, what would you like to do? Um, so certainly a, a TIA is concerning. Um, and I would also uh, make sure that he's been evaluated for other potential causes, uh, you know, such as um, any uh, atrial fibrillation or, or anything else, because his stenosis is still pretty, um, pretty mild uh, for, you know, for fixing this surgically. Um, so I'd want to investigate any other potential causes at this point. Yeah, so can't find anything else. His um, EKG and all the other findings are within normal limits. He's got normal sinus rhythm. Um, nothing else that you can see. Okay. Um, and so at, at that point, um, at 60% stenosis, he's on the left side and his his uh it was a right arm okay um so i don't think he qualifies at this point for for any surgical intervention um and uh, i would um have him referred to neurology for um uh, otherwise uh, stratification and uh, management of of this um tia okay all right doctor uh, what range would you fix this or what range do you think he's a, uh, he's a candidate for carotid? 75 75 percent stenosis or greater 75 um, percent okay all right uh, yeah so let's say he he is at 75 percent what would you do uh so i would counsel him that uh he would that i would recommend a uh, a left-sided uh carotid endarterectomy uh which would be just a removal of the plaque um in the uh external or in the um common and internal uh, carotid um, to help reduce his risk for a stroke uh, in the future. Um, and so then I would also explain to him some of the complications um, surrounding this can be stroke uh, in and of itself, um, but that uh, this, this would be uh, an effective way to manage his risk and to prevent future occurrences of strokes and or TIAs. Okay, great. So he agrees you're in the operating room. Tell me what you want to do. Yeah, so I'd position the patient with a bump under the uh, bump under the flex the flex the neck, uh, uh, tip his head towards the other opposite side, uh, and then with an incision over the sternocleidomastoid mastoid uh, on the anterior border, uh, go ahead, dissect down, um, split uh, and divide the common facial vein, exposing the carotid bifurcation, and then make a, a uh, once that's exposed, get uh, proximal and distal control. Um, uh, of the external, internal, and uh, the common carotid. Then I would heparinize the patient, and um, once that's performed, I would uh, then uh, go ahead and uh, open the common carotid onto the uh, internal carotid based on where I feel the most disease, and um, place, a, uh, place a shunt uh, to shunt the blood flow to the internal carotid, and uh, perform uh, the endarterectomy um, and then uh, do a patch, a bovine uh, pericardium patch angioplasty um, for repair. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let's stop there for a second. Okay. All right. 
So, um, yeah, carotid, you know, um, pretty well handled. Um, that 